Lecture 21, Livy, Tacitus, Plutarch. Welcome to Lecture 21, in which we're going to turn from Roman poetry to the prose genres of history and biography. We'll focus in particular on two Roman historians, Livy and Tacitus, and then we'll move on to the closely related genre of biography and talk about Plutarch. Now, in historiography, as in other genres, Roman authors modeled themselves to a large extent on their Greek predecessors in terms of style, format, and presentation. In fact, the very earliest Roman historians historians wrote in Greek rather than in Latin. But there were also differences in the materials available to the Roman historian, the source materials which he could draw upon, and in the Roman historian's own view of the purpose of his writing. Herodotus and Thucydides, as you'll remember, had set the overall parameters of history, and Roman historians did not deviate from these. Wars and politics remained the primary focus of historiography and the primary motivation, perhaps, for writing history. And in Rome, this focus was made even more pointed because of the civil struggles of the first century BC that I've referred to in the last few lectures. But Roman historians, far more than their Greek predecessors, took a pronounced moral stance on the issues they recorded. They wrote not just to memorialize, as Herodotus had, or to inform future generations, as Thucydides said he was doing. Roman historians tended to write deliberately to warn and to instruct as well as to memorialize and to inform. Now, one major difference is that unlike Greek city-states, Rome was a literate culture from its earliest years. And while the Romans did not have official records going all the way back to the foundation in 753 BC, they did have official records called Annales Maximi, or Greatest Annals, which were kept from at least the fourth century BC onward. The Annales Maximi listed the names of ruling magistrates and recorded important events, not with any detail, just as a list. But this means that Roman historians writing in, say, the first century BC had records for events of the past year by year. That's why these records were called Annales. They were organized on a year by year basis. The very earliest Roman historians' works are lost but their fragments indicate that a year-by-year -year organization was common in early Roman historiography. So the Annales Maximi set to some extent the form as well as giving information about the content of Roman historiography. Rhetoric was also a crucial influence on the development of the writing of Roman history, which makes sense in a, a form of history that sees one of its purposes to warn and to instruct the more persuasively you can put your position, the more likely you are to be able to warn and to instruct. In fact, no less a rhetorician than Cicero, the great orator, had expressed his desire that history should be written by an orator. Cicero said that the historian should be an orator by training. According to this school of thought, history needs not only to give information, but to persuade the reader to the historian's viewpoint. And if you look at it this way, the writing of history and the practice of forensic rhetoric would be very closely related. The same skills that allow a lawyer, an orator, to persuade a judge or a jury to his position would also allow the historian writing history to persuade the reader to his position. So the same techniques of or of rhetoric were appropriate to both the orator and the historian. Now, for the early history and development of Rome, our most important source is Livy, Titus Livius in Latin, who lived from around 59 BC to AD 17. Most of Livy's great work, which he called Ab Urbe Condita, from the foundation of the city, is lost. But the surviving parts of this work include enough material that we can pretty clearly reconstruct Livy's overall project. He was a provincial, like Virgil, 
and Horus and Catullus. Livy was born in Padua and moved to Rome at some point during his life, but he had returned to Padua by the time of his death. Now, unlike other important Roman historians, Livy never held public office himself, and thus he did not take a direct part in the events he narrates. In this regard, he resembles Herodotus more closely than Thucydides. He's writing not as someone who took part in the events he's writing about, but rather as an outside observer. Livy's great history, Ab Urbe Condita, which again means from the foundation of the city, set out to recount Rome's history from its beginnings up to his own day. So he's rather Herodotian in that regard as well, that he takes this enormous project to record the history of Rome from 753 BC up to his own day, the late first century BC. The work in its totality consisted of 142 books, or 142 papyrus scrolls. Of these, only 35 has, have survived. What we have are books 1 through 10, which cover events from Rome's mythic origins up through 289 BC. Then we also have books 21 through 45, which cover the time period 218 through 167 BC. Unfortunately, we don't have Livy's account of events of his own day. Books 41 and 43 through 45 are, are damaged, so even the books we have are not completely intact. Now, in addition, we have summaries of Livy's work, summaries of the missing, missing books, probably compiled in the 4th century AD of everything except book 136 and 137. Think of these as the cliff notes of antiquity, if you like. Summaries of what Livy said, um, short, and unfortunately not terribly accurate summaries. We know that they aren't terribly accurate because we can compare the summaries with the books that do exist. For instance, we can look at the summaries of books 1 through 10, then read Livy book 1 through 10, and unfortunately the summaries are not always terribly accurate. So while they are much, much better than nothing, for reconstructing what the rest of Livy's work said. We do have to use them with caution. They don't always get it quite right. In the earliest sections of his work, Livy deals with purely legendary materials. Obviously, he has to. He's writing about events on the founding of Rome, and there are no records. Remember, the Annales Maximi do not go back that far. So, in some ways, these sections where he's dealing with pure, purely legendary materials, in some ways these sections illustrate his overall approach and his method most clearly. Events that took place at the time of Rome's foundation and for the next two or three centuries could not be proven or verifiable since there were no written records and since, as we talked about in the lecture in Herodotus, reliable, verifiable oral tradition doesn't stretch back anything like that far. It only stretches back about three generations. Livy, therefore, had to rely on traditional stories, such as the legend of the birth of Romulus and Remus and their upbringing in part by a wolf, in part by a shepherd. He had to rely on that kind of legend to describe the development of the early Roman state and on up through the reign of Etruscan kings over Rome, their overthrow and the foundation of the Republic, the Roman system of government which we call the Republic. For all of that material, Livy had to rely on traditional stories that could not really be verified. He fills the stories out with details, events, and personalities that not only make them memorable, but also point up the morals he wants to draw. And if this is ringing a bell in your mind and you're thinking, I've heard her say exactly this same thing before, yes, Livy works very much the way the Deuteronomistic historian worked in his treatment of the David stories, as we talked about in a lecture many, many lectures ago now. Now, Livy's preface makes it clear that he wrote in part out of anxiety about Rome's present stability. The fear that civil war might return seems never far from his mind. And in Livy's analysis, he sets out what he's trying to do with his work in his preface. In his analysis, politics and morals are closely connected. And focusing on legendary figures from the remote past allows him to give both positive and negative examples for his readers of the kind of behavior that should be avoided, the kind of behavior that should be emulated. This is why I say the sections where he's dealing with legendary material in some way give us a 
the clearest view we have of his method and his purpose, because as he tells us in his preface, he wants to point out exempla both to avoid and to follow. He says in the preface, in fact, that he has included legends from the remote, remote past specifically so that his readers could see how the steady decline of morals led to the state of affairs in his own day. He sees the history of Rome as a history of a decline of morals from the pristine beginnings down to his own day, a point at which he says, we can bear neither our vices nor their remedies. Really a rather hauntingly pessimistic statement. Our vices are such that society can no longer continue as it is, but we're incapable of tolerating the remedy of those vices. So he uses stories from the remote past to point up morals for his own day and to give examples for people of his own time. And at this point, as I've done before in several of these lectures, I want to zero in on one particular story, one particular narrative that Livy uses to try to illustrate his overall method and the points I'm making about it. I want to look at his treatment of the story of the rape and suicide of the Roman matron Lucretia. In Livy's account, the story of Lucretia provides an etiology, an explanatory story for the overthrow of the kings and the foundation of the Roman Republic. Her suicide leads to the overthrow of the kings. But Livy, Livy's treatment of Lucretia also provides an example of fortitude, self-control, and moral courage. Lucretia exemplifies those characteristics, and Livy leaves it to us to draw the moral that we should model ourselves upon her example of self-control, fortitude, and moral courage. Now, Lucretia, a Roman matron, Livy tells us, was raped by Sextus Tarquinius, the son of the ruling king. At first, when Tarquinius came into her room at night and tried to seduce her, she resisted him. Then when he moved from seduction to attempted rape and threatened to kill her if she continued to resist, she did continue to resist. She would have preferred to die than to submit to rape. But Tar Sextus Tarquinius makes her submit to rape by threatening her that if she continues to resist him, he will kill her, and more than that, he will kill a slave. He'll put their naked bodies in the bed together, and then he will tell her husband that he caught the two of them in bed, that he caught Lucretia in bed with a slave, and that he killed them to avenge this stain on the honor of his friend, her husband. At this point, Lucretia submits to the rape because her only alternative is to suffer even worse dishonor if she is thought to have committed adultery with a slave. After the rape, Lucretia summons her father and her husband. She tells them what has happened and she declares her resolve to die, to kill herself rather than to live with the shame of what has happened to her. Now, her father and her husband urge her to reconsider. They say that she is innocent and blameless. This often surprises modern students that in a text written in the first century BC, the men, the father and husband, say to the woman, it's the mind that commits a crime, not the body. You have done nothing wrong. You have nothing to kill yourself over. Lucretia responds, although I absolve myself from wrongdoing, I do not free myself from punishment. Nor shall, nor shall any unchaste woman hereafter live through Lucretia's example. And with these words, she kills herself. Now, Lucretia here is not saying, I think this is a very important point to understand for what Livy is doing with the story, Lucretia is not saying that she herself is unchaste. She agrees with her father and her husband so far as that goes. I absolve myself from wrongdoing, she says. But what she is saying is that if she chose to live after having been raped, in the future, adulterous women could cover their own crimes by claiming that they had been raped unwillingly. And so she is unwilling to provide a cover story for later unchaste women to use to cover up their own crimes. She's innocent and she's blameless. But in her understanding of her situation, that is no longer the important point. What is important is the greater good of Roman society. And so she chooses to die, even though she recognizes her own innocence, rather than to continue her, continue her life to the possible detriment of the moral fiber of her society. She also, before she kills herself, 
urges her husband and father to decide what punishment is due to the rapist. She says, that's basically your business. My business is to see to it that no unchaste woman hereafter can live through my example. Now, in fact, Lucretia's suicide leads her husband and his friend Brutus to overthrow the royal house of the Tarquins, to expel these Etruscan kings from Rome, and this leads to the foundation of the Roman Republic. So Lucretia's death not only leads to vengeance against her rapist through the overthrow of the kings, but it also leads to a new and admirable form of government for Rome. Now, Lucretia's story gives us a microcosm of Livy's method. It is memorable, moving, well-crafted, filled with dramatic speeches. It's a very, very good story, just in terms of readability. But it also draws a very strong parallel between individual vice and lack of, of control, sexual in this case, but it could be applied to other kinds of vice and lack of control, and a deranged or inappropriate form of society. And on the other hand, it draws a similarly strong parallel between individual courage and sacrifice and appropriate and rational government. Now, I'm not trying to say that Livy is writing allegory here. It would be a mistake or an exaggeration to say that Sextus Tarquinius is an allegorical representation of the profligate morals of the late Republic, as I talked about in the last lecture, a uh, society in which adultery was widely condoned, divorce was common, so forth. I don't think Livy is writing allegory. On the other hand, I think the parallel that Sextus Tarquinius's lack of self-control and sexual vice reflected the inappropriate form of government of monarchy and that Lucretia's bold acceptance of the remedy necessary to root out those vices, Lucretia's fortitude and courage and self-sacrifice represents or is lined up with or underlines the importance of the republican form of government. In fact, Lucretia's acceptance of the remedy, her own death, that's necessary to get rid of the vices of her own day, pretty clearly recalls the sentence in Livy's preface that I mentioned a few minutes ago, where he says, we can tolerate neither our vices nor the remedies necessary to get rid of them. Lucretia looked at the vices and applied the remedy, even at the cost of her own life. So Livy, throughout his work, gives us moral exempla and is writing very definitely with the idea of encouraging, almost exhorting the people of his own day to look to the good moral exempla, the better morals of the past and try to return to them. The next great historian I want to consider is Publius Cornelius Tacitus, Tacitus in Latin, Tacitus as he's pronounced in English. Now, unlike Livy, Tacitus is what's often called a senatorial historian. That means that he had taken part in politics himself, he had held public office, and so he was a direct participant in the Roman political system in a way that Livy was not. And he also concentrated on much more recent events. So in that regard, Livy is more like Herodotus, Tacitus is more like Thucydides. Tacitus was born around A.D. 56 and died around A.D. 117 or 118. We don't know very many details of his life. We know that he held important public offices in Rome and probably in the provinces as well. And we know that he began writing after the death of the emperor Domitian in A.D. 96. Up to that point, it had been too dangerous to write about the current political state in Rome. But under the rule of the next two emperors, Nerva and Trajan, Tacitus felt able to express his opinions freely. His two greatest works are called the Histories and the Annals. And both of these survive, unfortunately, only incompletely, but enough remains of each to give us a good sense of Tacitus' style, his material, and his subject matter. The Histories was published around A.D. 109. Originally, it contained 14 books and covered the years from 69, which was the reign of the Emperor Galba, to 96, the death of Domitian. We have books one through four in the beginning of book five, so the narrative ends in the year 70. The Annals, which most scholars consider Tacitus' most important work, was published around A.D. 116. It began with the death of Augustus in A.D. 14, concluded with the suicide of Nero in 68. And 
Of the original 18 books of the Annals, we have books 1 through 4 and 11 through 15, which cover portions of the reigns of Tiberius, Claudius, and Nero. Now, in both these works, Tacitus focuses on the virtues of the old Roman Republic and the degeneracy of life, habits, and mores under the emperors. So he's coming at the same subject matter as Livy, but writing later and able to see how things have gone downhill, morally speaking, under the emperors, just as Livy said things went uphill, morally speaking, in the Republic after the reign of the Etruscan kings. In, now, Tacitus was writing at a time when the government was good. He was writing under good emperors, but he was acutely aware of the instability inherent in a system of imperial rule. It depends on the character of the emperor. If you have a good emperor, society can be very good. If you have a bad emperor, society can be very, very bad indeed. Tacitus himself tells us that he writes, as he puts it, sine ira et studio, without anger or partisanship. Again, he presents himself in a rather Thucydidean manner, saying that he's writing purely objectively. In the opening paragraph of the Annals, he writes, and I'm quoting here, the successes and reverses of the old Roman people have been recorded by famous historians, and fine intellects were not wanting to describe the times of Augustus till growing sycophancy scared them away. The histories of Tiberius, Caius, Claudius, and Nero, while they were in power, were falsified through terror, and after their death were written under the irritation of a recent hatred. Hence my purpose is to relate a few facts about Augustus, more particularly his last acts, then the reign of Tiberius, and all which follows without either bitterness or partiality. That's the without ira et studio, without anger or partisanship or bitterness or partiality. You can translate it in various ways. From any motives to which I am far removed. So I'm not writing out of anger over bad emperors. I'm not writing out of partisanship for one party or another. I'm simply trying to describe how it was. So Tacitus gives us a view of life under the emperor, emperors. Livy writes about the history of the Republic. Now, unlike these two historians, Plutarch, to whom I want to turn at this point for the rest of the lecture, was a Greek who had lived in Greece all his life. However, his biographical writings, Plutarch is really the father of later biography in Western literary tradition, Plutarch's biographical writings focused as much on Romans as on Greeks, and Plutarch was a Roman citizen. Remember, Rome had conquered Greece or had brought Greece into its power in 146 BC, and so at this point in the classical world, we have ethnic Greeks living in Greece, writing in Greek, who are Roman citizens and who are writing about Roman topics. Whether we classify them as Greek authors or Roman authors is largely a matter of terminology. In fact, Greek was the second language of the Roman Empire at this time, and so even ethnically Roman, Latin-speaking writers would sometimes choose to write in Greek. Plutarch was born in Greece, as I said, in Chironia around AD 50. He spent most of his life there. He died in 120. He studied in Athens as a young man. He traveled to Rome at some point and held several important political positions, both in his hometown and priestly positions at the nearby oracle or sanctuary of Delphi. Plutarch was a prolific writer. Over half his total work is lost, but what remains is truly impressive. Broadly speaking, we can divide Plutarch's works into two main categories, the lives and the moralia. The lives, which are also called parallel lives, and which are what I want to look at here, are biographical sketches of famous Greeks and Romans. The moralia are treatises on a wide variety of subjects, primarily philosophical and ethical. Now, in the lives of the parallel lives, Plutarch pairs famous Greeks and famous Romans. So he writes about one Greek and one Roman and pairs them together. There are a total of 22 such pairs of lives. The pairing can be done on the basis of character, political situation, historical importance. So for instance, Plutarch pairs Romulus with Theseus, the traditional founder of Athens, Pericles with Fabius Maximus, Alcibiades with Coriolanus, Caesar with Alexander, Cicero with Demosthenes, which causes me quite a pang since we have a lecture on neither Cicero nor Demosthenes in this course. In most of the pairs, 
Plutarch concludes with a few paragraphs of commentary and comparison, but overall he lets the resemblances speak for themselves. Now, Plutarch himself states that he is writing biography and not history. His conception of what biography entails is rather different from ours. I want to quote to you what he says in the opening of his Life of Alexander, which again is paired with the life of Caesar, about his own methodology. Plutarch says, the careers of these men embrace such a multitude of events that my preamble shall consist of nothing more than this one plea. If I do not record all their most celebrated achievements or describe them exhaustively, but merely summarize what they accomplished, I ask my readers not to regard this as a fault, for I am writing biography, not history, and the truth is that the most brilliant exploits often tell us nothing of the virtues or vices of the men who performed them, while on the other hand, a chance remark or joke may reveal far more of a man's character than the mere feat of winning battles. It is my task to dwell upon those actions which illuminate the workings of the soul and by this means to create a portrait of each man's life. I leave the story of his greatest struggles and achievements to be told by others. So Plutarch is interested in conveying the character of the men he's writing about. He does not see the facts of their careers in exhaustive detail as a part of biography proper. There had been earlier instances of biography before Plutarch wrote in the sense of works devoted to the doings of a single man, and historians too often wrote works focusing on one man, for instance, Alexander the Great. But Plutarch brought to the genre of biography a sophistication in his analysis of character, of motivation, and of moral implications that was unprecedented before him. Now, Plutarch is an extremely important author in his own right, but he is, I think, even more important in his Nachleben, to use the German word, afterlife, what his work meant in later literary tradition. The influence he had on later European historiography, biography, and literature is almost incalculable. This may seem surprising because the lives are not particularly familiar to modern readers, but in the Renaissance and after, Plutarch's lives were among the most widely read works of classical literature. Amio's French versions of the lives, published in 1559, and the Moralia in 1572 are considered classics of French literature in their own right. And in English, Sir Thomas North translated the lives in 1579, working largely from Amio as well as from Plutarch's or original. Now, the influence of these translations was profound. And to take just one, but the most important example, Shakespeare relied on Plutarch through North's translation to an astonishing extent. I said in the previous lecture that Ovid was the author to whom Shakespeare turned most readily when he wanted an example or a comparison. This is true, but Plutarch comes second only to Ovid. And Re Shakespeare's Roman history plays are drawn almost directly from Plutarch. It's scarcely an exaggeration to say that Julius Caesar and Antony and Cleopatra are Plutarch, or perhaps Sir Thomas North's Plutarch, dramatized and set into verse. For instance, I want to read you a passage from North's translation of Plutarch and then a very famous passage from Antony and Cleopatra. And I think anyone listening to this will see the connection. These are two parallel passages in North and in Shakespeare that are very often adduced to show the extent of Shakespeare's reliance on North. This is North's translation of Plutarch describing Cleopatra in her barge. She disdained to set forward otherwise, but to take her barge in the river of Sidness, the poop whereof was gold, the sails of purple, and the oars of silver, which kept stroke and rowing after the sound of the music of flutes, halboys, citherns, viols, and other such instruments as they played upon in the barge. And now for the person of herself. She was laid under a pavilion of cloth of gold of tissue, apparelled and attired like the goddess Venus, commonly drawn in picture, and hard by her, on either hand of her, pretty fair boys apparelled as painters do set forth God Cupid, with little fans in their hands, with the which they fanned wind upon her. That's North, now Shakespeare. The barge she sat in, like a burnished throne, burnt on the water. The poop was beaten gold, purple the sails, and so perfumed that the winds were lovesick with them. The oars were silver. 
which to the tune of flutes kept stroke, and made the water which they beat to follow faster as amorous of their strokes. For her own person it beggared all description. She did lie in her pavilion, cloth of gold of tissue, or picturing that Venus where we see the fancy outwork nature. On each side her stood pretty dimpled boys, like smiling cupids, with diverse colored fans, whose wind did seem to glow the delicate cheeks which they did cool, and what they undid, did. Now I think anyone listening to those two passages will hear the correspondences, cloth of gold of tissue. Shakespeare lifts whole phrases from North, but Shakespeare also is Shakespeare and makes this his own, makes it some of the most memorable poetry he ever wrote, and yet without North, and thus without Plutarch, there would be no Cleopatra in her barge in Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. So in this lecture, we've looked very, very quickly at the prose genres of history and biography. In the next lecture, we will turn to yet another prose genre of Roman writing and discuss the Roman novel.